So uh, nice, so uh, we have 44 minutes left and we can actually uh, listen to, the, to my talk. So our agenda for today is the three, these three words. Actually, mm, this hour is our agenda for today. And nothing really changed, but I will finish with the word modern because it just takes uh, more slides. Uh, so let's start with the word pragmatic. Kotlin, as you know, is a language from JetBrains. And uh, it is a language intended for industry, intended to be used in like real project. It's not a research project. It doesn't uh, force you to read a book about type theory to understand better what is going on. And uh, it really tries to solve practical problems. So as it for Je from JetBrains, you can expect good tooling from, from, for it. And you're right, you have all these nice features that you used to have for Java development. Who here use IntelliJ? Oh, <laughs> this uh, nice So you have everything you used to have in IntelliJ for Kotlin as well. Another aspect of its uh, pragmatism for me is uh, that it can be easily mixed with Java, Java code. Uh, Kotlin code, you can uh, add Kotlin code to your project very slowly and uh, it will work. So you don't have to rewrite everything, you don't have to, to use it only for new projects, you can really use it in uh, your code base. For example, Kotlin compiler now is written, now it's, it's the most part are written in Kotlin, but anyway uh, we started adding Kotlin to the compiler in a very slow manner and um, we tested it ourselves for now for a long time, and uh, uh, and uh, it works fine. Kotlin code is compiled to Java bytecode, so you can it's then class files then can be transformed to Android format, so you can easily use it for Android. And uh, when we're talking about JVM languages, it's very clear that they can be used uh, together with Java code in a sense that you can involve you can call Java code from your language code, for example, for, from Kotlin code. There shouldn't be no, shouldn't be a problem with it. But for Kotlin, it works the other way around as well. So you can call Kotlin code from Java code. And important thing here is that it looks like regular Java code. It doesn't look dirty or strange or mysterious. It looks like a typical Java code. And that's important thing when it is important when you want to add like, you don't have to write your new whole model in Kotlin. You can write a new class, for, for in Android sense, uh, a new activity, and uh, um, uh, use it in your project nicely. Uh, the second item I mentioned uh, in the beginning, this Android friendliness. What does it mean? At first, Android Studio now is based on IntelliJ IDEA. That means that all this nice stuff from IntelliJ works for Kotlin for free, in the default environment for Kotlin. So it's just you install the plugin and then everything works. Another thing is that adding Kotlin to your final application doesn't, wo uh, wo uh, doesn't really uh, doesn't require lots of you because uh, Kotlin runtime jar is quite small. Uh, it's, it can be compared to just another library to your application. So it's not a big deal to just, so it's like really adding another library. Why it is so? In Kotlin, there is, we don't have Kotlin SDK. There is no such thing as Kotlin SDK. We just use Java, we just use regular JDK plus a bunch of extensions. So we don't, do not reinvent the whole world. For example, we use Java collections. Uh, and uh, uh, these, the same collections uh, provide you uh, the easiness of interoperability. So you don't have to wrap and unwrap collections every time when you try to use, to mix the code, to use Kotlin code from Java and vice versa. It just works for free. So because of this Kotlin SDK, we have such small runtime and uh, there's one of the reasons why the, uh, the Java interop is so, so works so nice as well. Uh, so as for Java interop, uh, the Kotlin was designed such that you could uh, add it easily to your project. 
So one of the goals was to uh, have this interoperability. Okay, now our last keyword, buzzword, this modern language. And uh, there are, uh, for the rest of the talk, I will try to explain you why lots of people are so crazy about this, these modern languages. And uh, we'll have uh, three more items here. First one, concise, then safe, and then expressive. And what's important here is that it's not just Kotlin is concise, safe, and expressive. It is uh, important when we compare it to what we used to have, Java. So it is cons more concise than Java, safer than Java, and more expressive than Java. For example, if we're talking about Scala, I think three people here should be concerned, it is all true for Scala as well. So, and if we are talking about Swift, for example, it is also true for Swift. So they all are concise, safe, and expressive. Uh, but they differ in some implementation details and uh, the fact whether you have to read very smart books for programming in it. But anyway, there is, like, uh, there is, it, it is what uh, is similar for, like, modern languages. So let's start. Let's start with concise word. Uh, here you can see the typical Java code. Uh, that does nothing, it just stores the data. And um, what we can do with it? We can use uh, the Kotlin automated tool for conversion. There is actually a very nice way to learn a language. Uh, so if you, uh, if you start using Kotlin, you can, and you don't remember how to, what keyword to use to, uh, to declare a function, uh, you can always convert Java code, you can, uh, you can invoke this action, and it will automatically convert your Java code into Kotlin code. So, here's the result. It looks a bit more concise. It, uh, um, like, uh, we see less verbosity in it. And uh, under the hood, it uh, is the same code. So, when we saw Java code, we saw that there was uh, two fields, constructor and togetters. And here we declare exactly the same. Two fields, uh, the constructor and togetters, from Java point of view and from bytecode point of view. But in Kotlin, it's like two properties and the constructor, but it's, it doesn't make sense now. So uh, the thing is that uh, no, for now, we generally know how to express some, some things in a more concise manner. So again, this is not only Kotlin uh, way of uh, doing things. The same code you will see in Scala, in Swift, in Ceylon, etc. So maybe in Java something in the future, I don't know. So now we just want to be able to uh, declare such classes short, in a more short manner. And um, in Kotlin, there is one more thing uh, that you can do. You can add the keyword data to such class, and that will generate a bunch of useful methods for this class. So usually when we have data class, we want to have like the class that stores the data. We want to be able to compare it to, uh, so we need equals and hash code. It's nice to have to string. And uh, there are some other methods as well, but uh, the thing is that, again, um, there is concise manner of doing things. Okay, let's move on. And uh, we have our second password, safe. And Um, actually, this, uh, there is a term, this term, billion dollar mistake, and uh, it was invented by Sir Tony Hoare, who actually invented the null reference somewhere in the 60s or 70s, I don't remember. Uh, the thing is that, uh, he, he, how he called it, he, we can't now evaluate how much we spent on fixing such errors, or on fixing null pointer exceptions. The problem is that we have null pointer exception and we don't know what to do with it. 
what where it was from, we have to debug, we have to like see the source code, and there are lots of problems. And there is modern approach that is again this approach is similar not only it's not exclusive for Kotlin, it is similar for all these modern languages, but different in details, but in general it's the same. So the modern approach is to make null pointer exception a compile time error, not a runtime error. So we want to prevent such errors when we write code, not to fix them when we have exact error, when we have a runtime exception. And that's, that's general. So uh, who knows uh, what is uh, the way to fix it in Java 8 or in Scala? Yes, option types. And uh, in Kotlin there is another way to fix it. And I will show you in a now, actually. So Kotlin way to fix this is nullable types. Nullable types uh, are um, uh, just dust types. So uh, they, I'm sorry, just a second. So in Kotlin, you can declare a variable. When you declare a variable of a usual, of a regular type, like string, that means that you cannot store null in that variable. To be able to store null there, you have to declare it with question mark. You have to, to use a special nullable types. So uh, in Kotlin, you will have this uh, whole hierarchy of not nullable types, of regular types, and the similar hierarchy of nullable types. So for every not null types, uh, there is a corresponding nullable type that you can use. Uh, so you cannot store, you cannot assign null this uh, to S1. I think it should be clear. Uh, then what we can do with it, with uh, such variables of, of these types? Uh, S1, you can safely dereference. There is no problem with it. It's safe because it, it can't throw null pointer exception. It's clear, I think. Uh, but talking to us about S2, it's not as safe because we see that it can store null reference. It can store something, uh, some, something meaningful, but it can store null as well. So the compiler forbids to dereference it in this manner. And uh, okay, but then what should I do to dereference it? And uh, we have different options in Kotlin. First one, you can check it explicitly for being not null. Obviously, you can do the same thing in, in a good old Java, but uh, in this case, your Java code will be unreadable, it will be full of boilerplate, and uh, it's better not to do it. Uh, so uh, you can do the same thing in Kotlin, and you can notice that after checking, uh, the S seems to, be, to have the uh, the right type. And in Kotlin, we call this feature smart cast. That means that you can check for a type and then you can uh, consider the variable of having the necessary, the required type. Okay, so there is one way to deal with null pointer exceptions, but even the compiler, actually not the compiler, but the intentions in IntelliJ will suggest to um, simplify it. And uh, you can write simply like this. If I'm not mistaken, this operator was, to it's, it's this called safe uh, reference operator, safe call operator. If I'm not mistaken, it was, it was stolen from Groovy, uh, so we didn't invent it. And what it means is that if S is null, return null as a result. If S is not null, return what is what, what the, the result of uh, evaluating string. So the result of this expression will be int question mark will be nullable int. So the result can contain null. That's clear. Every, everyone is here. Yeah, that's that's great. So what you can do else? Uh, you can provide a default value for null case. In this example, uh, you say that okay, if it's null, then the result will be zero. And there is a concise syntax for for that as well. This is called the separator, and it was as well, if I'm not mistaken, stolen for Groovy, and uh, for some people it reminds Alice. Uh, what you can do uh, uh, next, uh, Kotlin, the Kotlin compiler is uh, quite smart, and uh, for example, if you check for being the reference for being null, and then invoke a function that just fails, uh, that means uh, that can only throw an exception inside, then you can 
there are, the, in the end, you can pro interpret that variable of having the right type as well. And uh, there is the last operator. Uh, there is actually uh, throw us null pointer if it's null, and uh, but you you see you do it explicitly, and um, uh, actually the Swift language uh, has the similar concept of nullable types. So you if you like didn't know it beforehand, now you know it the, how it works in Kotlin and in Swift together. That's great, and uh, and there uh, they have one exclamation mark for the reference it. In Kotlin we have to just uh, to say that please don't do it. It's just a very dangerous operation. If you're really sure, if you're smarter than compiler, you can, but prefer more safe uh, operators. And obviously you shouldn't do it like two such dangerous operations at one line because it what this what uh, leads to um, something unreadable, to unreadable code. So the main idea is that we have these nullable types and the means to uh, cope with them. Okay, and now there is some comparison with the option types and uh, oh, the reasons uh, why to some extent nullable types are preferable, especially for Android. Under the hood, these nullable types are just annotations. So at runtime, you have just objects, just references. There, there are no wrappers, there are no some some uh, extra objects created to store your code is just uh, at runtime is the same. At compile time, there is uh, additional protection. And if you use option types, you have the wrappers. It is uh, it's suitable for some purposes. But if you are like constrained with resources and uh, you need uh, to be as efficient as possible, then uh, this approach might be better. The last buzzword, expressive. And what do we mean by this keyword in Kotlin? Uh, in general, it's about being able to, uh, like to beautify your code, to make it more beautiful, nicer, to, to, like to, uh, uh, to have more uh, enjoy, uh, like to get more joy while writing it and so on. So, uh, once, uh, recently, I've uh, watched uh, a talk uh, by the guy who, like, was brave enough to use uh, the Kotlin for a year before the release, and uh, he, in production, in real project, and he uh, told a phrase that, um, okay, so now he had an example, and, okay, now we have a repetition, some, some code duplication, but we are reading code in Kotlin, and that means that we can avoid it. And uh, of course, we can avoid, like, to some extent, we, we can do the same thing in Java as well. But in Kotlin, it just, um, it just, uh, you can do usually it in a nice way that doesn't, um, like, uh, worse things. It's it just, uh, get, uh, we, we can do it in a manner that helps us to read the code. So, uh, now I'm going to show you three features of a language that, uh, from my point of view, are responsible for this expressiveness. And um, um, the first two you, mu you might be um, familiar with, like extension functions, uh, are, like if you used C Sharp, you worked with them. Uh, lambdas now, I think everybody, everyone uh, nowadays knows about lambdas. And the last one is exclusive for Kotlin. So this lambdas with receiver thing is a special one, and uh, that might uh, might interest someone who like knows uh, enough of lambdas and of Scala and of some other stuff. This there is this is something new. So let's start. Let's start with extension functions. Um, who've uh, heard about extension functions from other different languages before? Okay, so we can stay here for a bit longer. Uh, then, what does it mean? Uh, in as I've told already, in Kotlin we don't have our own library. We use Java standard library. So we use Java standard string class. And we can't add methods to it. I think everyone, almost everyone in their projects have string utils, class, package, whatever, to, and a bunch of uh, 
methods to improve this classical string class. In Kotlin, we can do it in a fancy manner by extending the string class and uh, writing a, an extension method to it. So there is a syntax. Actually, there is a syntax for declaring a function in Kotlin. Usually, when you declare a function, you just don't write this re receiver thing. But this means that we declare a function, uh, a receiver, an extension function to string. Mm. Uh, we have this, and uh, as usual for this reference, it can be omitted. So in Java, when you when you use this, you usually can can just omit omit it and write uh, what you have without it. So with extension functions, you can do the same. And uh, this reference inside the body of extension functions refers to the class that we extend. So in this example, string. What we can, uh, how how it is beneficial in Kotlin, we can use uh, we can call extension extension functions. On, a, on an object that we extend. So in this example on a string. We can write just string dot and our function. And it is very convenient when you use IDE because you have all these functions in, in completion. And uh, how do you usually write code? Like we, we mm, press Completion, we invoke completion, and then we choose what method is suitable for our purposes. And we, having all these extension functions really helps, because you don't have to go to a special string util class to find out what uh, methods are available for string or for your, for your type, other type. You just can look, at, look them through in, in completion. Uh, how it is different from other implementation, for example, C Sharp, is that uh, if you declare an extension function and you want to use it, you have to import it explicitly. You can't uh, just use it everywhere in your project. Uh, because if you could, uh, that will like make everything uh, less uh, maintainable, less understandable, because you use function where it come from, where, where it uh, came from. That's a question, and uh, with the import, you can still you can see what's going on. Uh, so uh, then there is a question. Maybe some of you ask uh, whether it's possible to, for example, uh, call private methods from extension from your extension functions, private me members of the class. And to answer this, I want you uh, to explain how these extension me methods are actually implemented. Uh, here is our last char extension methods declared in Kotlin, and it is compiled to regular Java static function that just uses f string as a first argument. So you can call it from Java. Uh, it's an example when we call Kotlin code from Java code in this manner. So it's just a, you, a regular function that is declared in a special class corresponding to file name. And that's how it works. So who uh, now may answer whether we can call private members of the class from an extension function? So there is a question. We declare extension function for string, like class char. Are we able to call uh, private members of string from this extension function? Yes, of course not, because it's just a static function. It doesn't have any special allowance for the class. So. It doesn't differ. So it's only convenience. It's only like syntactic sugar for us, very useful because we have it in completion and so on. Okay. So in Java, you can import statically and it looks really like Java code. Uh, then I want to show you some examples for Android and how extensions works great in an Android environment. And uh, this uh, Text, it usually, it uh, just invokes, the, it shows you a toast on your Android screen. And uh, we, this, how we can write it in a Java manner, just converting their, automatically converting their Java code to Kotlin. And that's how we can write it in Kotlin. It looks simpler. Yeah, a bit. And uh, how it's done. Actually, this reference is an activity. So we inside an activity and we, uh, like, um, use uh, this reference to invoke the toast. And in Kotlin, we can write the extension function named toast that does, uh, does exactly the, uh, the, the string written in the first line. And then we can omit this 
and uh, have have it works, have it worked. So there's an example of how extension functions can help you simplify your code. So our, our goal here is to to like to make the code as simple as possible, to avoid boilerplate, to extract what is repeated usually into a function, for example, because this code, it, it is short, of course, but anyway, it is repeated often, and uh, we can avoid even this duplication. Another example for Android, there is uh, how we start another activity. Uh, the details are not very important for uh, here. Again, the example how we can simplify it, we can write Kotlin function, that is an extension function to an activity that does exactly the same, and uh, uh, when we emit this reference, it looks much simpler for us to, 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 understand, to, to understand the code. It looks much more readable. Okay, uh, then an example of avoiding duplication, another example. Uh, Let's say in your code, uh, there is um, actually a kind of example that we invented to show something in the book. So uh, there is, imagine there is JetBrains employees, and we have two offices, uh, not more than two, but we have offices in Munich and in Prague. And uh, we want, we are interested in an average age for employees that are working in both of these cities. So to count it, this code is, is, looks very simple. It uses lambdas. I expect uh, that, uh, I suspect that you understand what's going on here. It should be generally clear. So we just, at first, we filter uh, employees only from the necessary city. Then we, um, s uh, then we're interested in their ages, and then we find average of the ages. And uh, even such duplication in your code can be nicely avoided with an extension function. And uh, what's nice in Kotlin is that you can declare such extension function, uh, like uh, you can make it private in a file, for example, or you can declare it locally inside another function. So you don't have to like to make an API from this. Uh, you, you don't have to make this a part of your system, part of your API. So the, the, the thing is that uh, even in a small cases when there is a bit of uh, repetition in your code, you can avoid it by uh, declaring some local, internal, private functions that help, that make it more readable. Okay, now the second, uh, maybe there are questions for this, for this point. Any questions for now? Okay, uh, then uh, we are going to lambdas. I think that, uh, who, who, no, who knows about lambdas, uh, so listen to it. Okay, I think everyone, uh, almost everyone. So uh, there is a syntax for lambdas in Kotlin. Uh, you can filter the employees who live in Prague. In this uh, uh, case, uh, in this example, we used member reference as well. So the first one, uh, you see it variable inside a lambda that is a Kotlin way to to say that okay, we have only one parameter in the lambda, so uh, by default, its name is it. And the full uh, form of lambda, the full syntax will be like this. Uh, member reference is a rather simple thing as well. So it is a lambda that just uh, returns one, one, one property or one, one function, one result. And uh, it's just, uh, to some extent, it's just a syntactic form. It's the same uh, in Java. It's similar to Java 8, so it's, there is nothing like modern, not modern, but uh, very difficult here. Okay, so an example from Android again. Um, I, I think it's not, uh, it, it's the same, not only in Android, but in an, every environment when you, when you use uh, these anonymous classes when, with only one method. Uh, in Kotlin, it can be rewritten like this. So we, we, we see the toast example before. And, uh, the thing is that you can pass pass lambda uh, where the uh, class with this, or where this uh, interface with only one method is expected. And uh, important thing here is that this set on click listener is the same method. So we don't declare a new method in Kotlin. You can use this conversion, automatic conversion from Kotlin code for every Java code that uses uh, so called SAM interfaces. Single, abs uh, single abstract method interfaces, okay? Uh, and um, 
uh, it again allow you to simplify the code, uh, the the final code that you have. Um, okay, now let's move uh, sl slowly to one the most difficult feature in Kotlin, this lambdas with the receiver thing, and uh, let's start with an example. Um, please read this code. It's not very difficult. I think you should understand what's going on. We just create a string builder and then we append something to it. Yeah, that's clear. And uh, my problem here is that uh, this uh, we repeat for several times this string builder, this variable. Uh, for now, it's only two letters, but usually you have like long variable name it, and uh, again, it's a kind of a duplication. So you have to repeat this variable name and what you can do with it. And um, in some languages, there is a feature called with. Uh, what does it do? It just says, okay, let's do something with this variable. Uh, it's just, uh, we, we, now we saw that uh, at first example we had, we had to repeat it several times, in the second example uh, we have to repeat it only once. That's a good thing. Yeah? And uh, indeed some languages have it as a language feature. And uh, what is a word for expressiveness about Kotlin? Uh, the most important thing here is that with in Kotlin is a function. It's not a co built-in construct is a regular function declared in a standard library. Are you here? Are you still with me? Please uh, think it over a bit. So again, uh, I think the, uh, the semantics of this uh, feature of what with does should be clear for you. And then there is this thing that in Kotlin it's a function. And in the next slide we are going to understand how it works, why it's a function, and, wh and why lambda through the series. Uh, so, um, maybe some questions here. I think now we are looking at the most difficult thing in Kotlin, so if you have any question, if you have any misunderstanding, then please ask, because it, it's the high chance that the half of the room have the same question. Okay, let's move on. Uh, so, who is actually here with me? I just, okay, everyone, that's great, I'm sorry. It's just, uh, I'm very afraid of losing you with some laptops or something. So, uh, what's going on? Why is a function? So again, with is a function. Uh, lambda is its second argument. In Kotlin, we have uh, the following convention, that uh, if lambda is a la the last argument, you can move it outside the parentheses. It, uh, it turns out to be very convenient, actually. So this is another syntax to write the same thing. But it's not really nice, is it? So indeed, with is a function, a string builder is the first, its first argument, lambda is its second argument. And um, so now it's, again, it's just a syntactic convention. And this is an implicit receiver in the lambda. So now we see this lambda with implicit receiver. And uh, as usual for this, it can be omitted. So we have the same code as, as uh, the previous slide. And that's how it works in Kotlin. And this feature, these lambdas with receivers, is, uh, turns out to be a really powerful feature. Okay, uh, so um, we, we can make it even more simple. Mm. Because uh, you see, string bu uh, making a string builder is uh, so typical task, so we can define a special function for this, a, string, a build string function, and uh, it will take one argument, this lambda with receivers, re with receiver, and uh, uh, what it does, it uh, just uh, creates a new string builder and applies all this, uh, wh what is going on in the lambda to this, to to this receiver. Returning to with function, what's going on? I'm sorry, I, I forgot about it. Uh, what's going on? We have its first argument and lambda with the receiver. And uh, we, what, what is actually, what does with the with function do is it applies the body of the lambda to its argument. So it substitutes uh, the, uh, the, what with function do, it substitutes this first argument to 
to the code that is provided in the Lambda in, with the receiver. And what a build string function does, it's create a new string builder and it substitutes, uh, it invokes all the code in the Lambda, uh, having in mind that string builder is this implicit receiver. <laughs> How are things? Maybe you, you, you can ask something. Okay, that's, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, this one is defined as standard library as well, yeah. So, yeah, we, we have now this lambda with the receiver, and uh, this can be omitted, so now you should understand. This, the most difficult feature in Kotlin, the, the, the most uh, modern and new. And um, this is an example for one nice talk about Kotlin for Android, actually. Um, and um, uh, what's going on here is that we have this pattern of uh, doing something with the database, doing an operation in a safe manner. We have to begin transaction and then we have end transaction in the final block. And uh, we notice a bit of duplication again, because what is um, like exclusive for this pattern is what's going, what, what is exactly an action, yes? And everything else is uh, just a routine, a ceremony that we have to repeat uh, for every new time. And with Kotlin, we can avoid this ceremony by declaring the function in transaction that just takes an action that uh, should be performed. And uh, actually, this in transaction thing is again the function that takes a lambda with the receiver as an argument and inside does uh, these things. Uh, the, the, it begins transaction it, uh, and it ends transaction in finally. And in a try block, it just calls the action that was passed to it as a, a lambda argument. And uh, why does uh, lambda is receiver? Because uh, in this lambda, this is implicit, so we can call uh, things on these implicit things. So uh, now a couple of words about how it is implemented under the hood. Because uh, in this example, you may ask, maybe this version is better in terms of performance. Because you see here is the lambda, and uh, uh, the problem with lambdas, especially for Java 6, that we target, the code and targets, is that uh, every lambda is transformed to an anonymous object. So an anonymous, an extra object is created for every such invocation. That's terrible. So we would prefer the first version. But that's, it's not the case, actually. Because in Kotlin, lambdas can be inlined. And that means no performance overhead. Uh, in Kotlin, you can declare a function as inline function. And that will mean that the generated bytecode is exactly the same as before. So uh, when Kotlin compiler will generate the, by the final bytecode, it will substitute lambda body, body into the final bytecode, and it will have like the same version. So you have everything. You have a uh, like, nice solution, nice code, and no performance overhead. And that's what really is like a uh, strong features of Kotlin, that you can create such, such uh, functions, such, such things. Okay, next I will uh, show you two more, oh, okay, maybe questions here before we move on about inlining. Any questions? What does inline mean? Uh, I'm sorry, was it a question or just a remark that I didn't heard? Okay. <laughs> That you can repeat it afterwards. Okay, so now we have uh, uh, the last thing, uh, and we uh, the an, uh, how uh, this feature, this lambda with receiver, lambdas with receivers, can be used to create um, some nice, really nice things, really new approach for something. And in the case of Android, is a DSL for dynamic layouts. Uh, you know that. Uh, you probably know that uh, in Android, when you uh, define your layout, you define it in XML. 
and uh, Kotlin provides you to define it in the code. Uh, and um, here is the first example. It's not uh, about layout, it's about alert. Um, but you see that this code actually creates an alert that is shown in the picture. And uh, you can see the direct correspondence between the code and the alert, I suppose. And um, under the hood, this code, uh, this alert, alert function, is a function that takes two, the, the first two arguments are strings, title and message, and then the third argument is, you can guess, with the receiver, <laughs> loud with the receiver. And this positive button and negative button are functions that can be, that are called on this implicit receiver. So that looks really nice and uh, easy to read. And uh, it uses the same pattern we saw in this transaction in with function and so on. Another example with uh, layouts, this one with layouts indeed. And uh, it is a custom layout uh, that you can create dynamically, declare dynamically in the code. So this uh, custom view and uh, vertical layout are Kotlin functions that are declared in the Anchor library. And uh, then you can uh, call edit text function and this edit text function will add the corresponding edit text field to your final layout. So in this example we have this email, text, view, then password, and uh, then we have this button that, that uh, you can see in the picture. So it is like a nice way to, to do XML-like structures. So it, is, it can be done not only with uh, Android, obviously, it can be, it, it can be done with uh, some other stuff as well. And um, it is a brand new approach, and it is a bit controversial because usually there are special designers who write your layouts in XML and then you just use them. Uh, but anyway, this approach has its benefits as well because it's the code and you can reuse it, you can abstract it, you can write a function that generates the layouts for you and so on. Okay, maybe questions about this thing, yes? Uh, there are parameters, all properties. So uh, you see here this vertical layer. So edit text is a function on receiver. And this receiver is a special class that corresponds to vertical layout. And it has a bunch of properties that you can set. And uh, vertical layout has uh, another arguments with default values that we, for this example, just emit. So in Kotlin, we have default values for arguments. And uh, you can specify them explicitly if you want. So this, uh, all this code actually is generated from, for these layouts and uh, it's quite straightforward how, how, to, how to do it. Okay, now bonus that wasn't uh, promised. Another thing for, uh, actually it is very special for Android, uh, the only one, but it has only two slides, so it's okay. And uh, uh, that what is called Kotlin Android extensions. And um, this, uh, actually it's an old name of a plugin. Uh, now it's built in. It's built for Kotlin plugin, for, for, for if you use it for Android, so for Android Studio, so uh, and now you you don't have to do something special to to have it. Uh, in Android, you have uh, you define layouts. You you not less. You define your views uh, by specifying uh, IDs in the XML. And then uh, in your code, you usually have to write the code find view by ID and then your ID, and then use this view. There are different frameworks that fix this problem to avoid boilerplate like butter knife. But with Kotlin, you do not need such projects. You can do simply like this. You can uh, just write the name of your uh, view in the code and use it as Kotlin, actually as Kotlin property. And this Kotlin property has the necessary type. So in this case, it has button type. And uh, only th the only thing you need to do is to import, import it explicitly and returning to Android uh, to extension functions. This is implemented in a very similar fashion. 
uh, actually it is declared as extension property. So you call ex this extension property and under the hood, the Kotlin compiler replaces it with the necessary code. And the next slide shows uh, what the compiler does secretly uh, when you don't, when you look some other place. So when you declare a Kotlin activity, each Kotlin activity, the Kotlin compiler adds a map, an actually nullable map, uh, that is initialized only if you use it, that stores all the cached views. So this code is generated. You don't see it. And when you use this uh, click me button, imported, the Kotlin compiler generates the code that takes this view from the map, that casts it to the necessary type, and then you can safely use it. And so when you re reuse it, you don't have to, to invoke uh, find view by ID. Uh, you just uh, get it from the cached from from the map of the from the cached map. Okay, so it it is concerned only for Android developers. And uh, uh, now, if you have any question about this, please ask me later because now I have this times up and it's blinking again. <laughs> and um, okay, so now I am finished. Uh, I want to to show you like there, there is Kotlin site. And uh, recently we released a 1.0 version, so you don't have excuses not to use it anymore. And uh, we have a way to call the Kotlin code in the browser. Uh, there is the strike Kotlin link org, and you can play with Kotlin without installing the plugins, the spoil, like spoiling your IntelliJ version and so on. So it's free. Uh, uh, it's a like simple way to try, and uh, there are Kotlin cons as well uh, that um, allow you to. It's a set of a task that you can accomplish to to learn Kotlin as well. And uh, tomorrow we'll have a workshop when uh, we'll uh, try to do some of these uh, tasks, but with my with the help of some of my explanations. But you can do all these uh, cons by your own uh, if you're interested. And another thing, there is a book that uh, we're currently writing, and uh, it's called Kotlin in Action, and uh, now it's ready for like two thirds of it, and there is a discount code if you want. Because uh, we have uh, the money that helps us to write a text that you would be able to read, actually. So now, thank you. Um, do we have time for questions? Oh, it's just over. Yes. So, is it uh, production ready and uh, no nasty bugs uh, like uh, to be handled in production? Like uh, we, I don't. Do do we have some nasty bugs? I I would say we do. Uh, we do not have nasty bugs for a while now, because nasty bugs are usually bugs that you can't avoid. But uh, we still have some bugs, but there are no nasty ones. I would say like this. So in this sense, it's ready. And now, because of the first version, it's uh, compatibility guaranteed. So now you can safely use it because it will be the the, the compatibility will be supported. Yes, another question. Uh, you have mentioned uh, that Kotlin is a uh, null safety language. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the first bonus slide, uh, you are talking. You have talked about uh, find by find view by this uh, thing. So uh, view with uh, IDs uh, just easily can't uh, exist in layout. So it's yes, just but ignores, if or? you see, if it doesn't exist in layouts, then you won't be able to import it with this thing. So oh. uh, the Kotlin oh. will generate I, I import thing. Yeah, yes, these things, these extension properties, only for layouts that are present. OK, thank you. Uh, then um, then uh, you have to, you, you can in Kotlin this feature called uh, like import as something. You, you can uh, write here as new name. Yeah, so that, this is the way how it fix, but usually you, you'd better avoid such situation, but there is a workaround. Yes. More questions? What is the comparison uh, uh, to Scala? Oh, compared to Scala, there's a good comparison. <laughs> I uh, 
I don't know. There's uh, the thing is that it is um, uh, so with incrementation with incremental compilation. So usually you don't uh, compile the whole project. You when you write code, you use incremental compilation. So there, there is the main question whether incremental compilation is supported. So now it is supported for uh, nicely. It works nicely for just uh, using Kotlin for regular things. But uh, in col in um, uh, in Android in Gradle, it is not. Uh, like uh, totally finished, but we are almost there. So incremental compilation helps. That helps. And uh, another thing uh, with compar com comparison with Scala, uh, in Kotlin we don't have uh, so much so complicated things to compile, F and uh, so that's this like easier language at all that makes things. Uh, Mm, better in the sense that uh, m m much more can be improved. Because with Scala, we, 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 for, for some extent, now we achieved the level uh, when, uh, so some things, uh, we should change something differently to, to, to have a better compilation. Okay? Uh, my last question. Um, how is it uh, compatible with stuff uh, Google is doing? For example, they um, implemented the restart activity, like super fast uh, uh, mm, relaunch of the activity with new code. And uh, if w uh, I would use uh, Kotlin, would it be uh, compatible? Like I, uh, I'm not sure I can ask, answer this question. Uh, so it depends on how it implemented uh, on, the, on their side. So uh, basically, mm, for the most things, uh, the things in Kotlin uh, can work because it's just compiled to Java bytecode. Uh, there, if something doesn't use uh, the bytecode, then it is more difficult to to achieve. But we, we, I think I should uh, I should like see the exact case. I'm not sure I can answer this. More questions? Okay, thanks. Have a good day.